Well, hello and welcome to the Stone Church Noon Hour Bible Study for today, which is May 20th. This is part six in a Bible study series that we've been doing that I've entitled Bread in the Wilderness. And it's a Bible study series that's based on the stories of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, their journey from slavery in Egypt through the Sinai Peninsula and ultimately into the land that God promised to give them. And again, I've chosen this Bible study because I think it's relevant to the situation we're in right now. We're in a time of desert wandering, where we're moving into an uncertain and unknown future that's a bit scary. And it's a time where we really have to trust in God and ground ourselves in him, just like the people of Israel had to when they were wandering around in the wilderness. There's so many rich lessons that we can learn from their experience. So I'll tell you where we are in the narrative right now. The people of Israel are on the verge of entering into the land that God promised to give them. And so what God does is he says to the people of Israel, send some spies into this land to basically gather information, you know, gather some reconnaissance and then come back and share it with everybody else. So that plunks us right down into the middle of the book of Numbers. Here's what we're focusing on today. I'll give you the, the chapter and verse. So it's Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. Then we're going to skip ahead to verse 25 and then read all the way over to chapter 14, verse 4. So what I encourage you to do is go get your Bibles, read that passage of Scripture. In fact, if you like to, you could read all of chapter 13 uh, right up to chapter 14, verse 4. Uh, when you've done reading that, come back, and then we'll walk through it verse by verse, and hopefully um, glean some insights here that would help us in our day-to-day -day journey as Christians, as disciples of Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to assume you've done that. Here we are at chapter 13, verse 1, and it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites, from each of their ancestral tribes you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them leading men among the Israelites. So the expedition is commanded by the Lord himself. He uh, actually tells Moses to select 12 men, one from each of the tribes, to go and explore the land of Canaan, the land that they are about to enter into. Um, and I put here in my notes, could this be a kind of test? Could this be a kind of test? Did, does, did the people of Israel really need the reconnaissance data? Is that an absolutely necessary thing for them to take the promised land? Or is God in a way um, testing the Israelites to see whether or not they trust in him enough to move into the promised land despite all of the dangers that the, um, that the scouts perceive there. I don't know. That's just a matter of speculation on my part. I invite you to reflect on it. What do you think? The Lord commands Moses, uh, again, to gather people from each of their ancestral tribes. These representatives are to be leaders within their respective tribes. And so the spies represent a cross-section of the nation. This cross-section of the nation, these 12 men, one from each tribe, are, are going to explore the, the promised land and, and bring back information for the people of Israel. So let's skip ahead now to Numbers 13, verses 17 to 20. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up there into the Negev and go up into the hill country and see what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land they live in is good or bad, and whether the towns that they live in are unwalled or fortified, and whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are trees in it or not. Be bold, and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now it was the season of the first ripe grapes. Okay. So they are to go up into the Negev and up into the hill country. Um, the Negev, which I think translates from Hebrew into English as parched or dry, 
is a territory that's south of Judah. It's on the outskirts, if you will, of the Promised Land, very hilly region. I think um, Mount Halak is supposed to be the highest point in the Negev. At any rate, the spies have been commanded to gather reconnaissance data um, that includes, number one, you know, roughly the military strength and numbers of the population, uh, the towns, how the towns are defended, do they have walls around them, are they fortified, uh, fortified cities, or are they somewhat more vulnerable than that? And also, they're supposed to get a sense of the wealth of the land. Um, the Hebrew word translated to spy out apparently is tur. Again, I remind you, my Hebrew is not good. Um, but this is what I've read in the course of my research on this passage of Scripture. And interestingly enough, the verb apparently is used in wisdom literature to describe how one searches for wisdom. So you may know that there is wisdom literature in the Bible. A good example of wisdom literature would be um, uh, Ecclesiastes. It's a good example. Um, another example would be the book of Job. So any book in the Bible that presents wise teaching uh, and knowledge and emphasizes the importance of wisdom is considered wisdom literature in the Bible. And apparently that verb, ter, which can be translated to spy out, is often used um, to describe the process of gathering knowledge, of, of gaining wisdom. So the spies, in a sense, are supposed to go into the promised land and gain wisdom, gain knowledge, gain insight, gain understanding into the quality of the land itself. The spies are to see with their own eyes the land that God is giving them and then come back and share that report with, with others. Um, which raises the question of what is wisdom from the Christian perspective? Well, perhaps one can think of wisdom as knowledge of the ways of God, knowledge of the kingdom of God. And we'll talk a little bit more about the kingdom of God later, but um, knowledge of, of the kingdom of God, knowledge of the ways of God in the kingdom of God, that could be a Christian understanding of what wisdom is all about. And in a sense, we are to, um, even though we're not in the kingdom of God now, we are to spy it out, uh, and we are to learn about it, grow in knowledge of it, and share that knowledge with other people. The spies are even commanded to bring some of the fruit of the land back, right? So that they can actually show the people of Israel, their own people, um, okay, these are the crops that grow here. And you can taste it. You can taste for yourself what the crops are like, what the grapes are like. So in a sense, the, the people of Israel are literally receiving a foretaste of the promised land, a foretaste of the land that they will eventually enter into. Numbers chapter 13, verse 21. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob, near Lebohamath. I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing that right. Lebohamath. Lebohamath. Um, at any rate, the journey begins at um, Zin, or Sin, a territory that's south of the Negev. We've talked about this region before in previous Bible studies. And we're told that the spies go as far north as Rehob. Um, and this was located at the extreme north of the land that would one day belong to Israel. It's even further north than the Sea of Galilee. So in short, what this verse tells us is that the spies covered a tremendous stretch of territory going all the way from the southern part um, of this region to the very northern part of it. So in other words, the entirety of the land that God has promised to give the people of Israel. Okay, on to Numbers chapter 13, verse 22. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, and Ahiman, Shesai, and Talmai, the Anakites, were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zohan in Egypt. So the spies are journeying north. They stop at a city called Hebron, which is... Uh, a little bit south of the city of Jerusalem, or what would one day be Jerusalem. And there they meet Ahiman, Shesai, and Talmai, who are apparently three sons of Anak. Three sons of Anak. Anak was a giant. He was numbered among the Nephilim, which is kind of a, uh, I don't know, a, a race of superhuman beings, apparently believed to be giants. 
Why is that significant? It's significant because knowledge of giants in the country heightens the sense of danger. If you are going to move into this new land, you're going to ulti ultimately have to um, face these men who are just titans, who have this larger-than-life status. So that heightens the sense of fear for the Israelites, as we'll see later on in a few verses. Moving on now. Numbers chapter 13, verses 23 to 24. And they, that's the spies, came to the Wadi Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between the two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster that the Israelites cut down from there. So it says that the single cluster of grapes that they cut is carried on a pole between the two of them. Now, why did they have to be carried on a pole between the two of them? Is that just a con convenient way of carrying grapes so that they don't get crushed? <laughs> I don't know. Or it could imply that the grapes were particularly large and heavy. Okay, and of course, this suggests two things. It suggests that the land is very fertile and very rich if it can produce fruit of this size and of this, uh, 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 you know, of this weight. And also it suggests that the people who inhabit the land are large and imposing. Um, they also brought back, back pomegranates and figs as evidence of the fruitfulness of the land. So again, it's like they're, they're bringing this stuff back to their own people, to the people of Israel. The people of Israel are going to see this fruit, they're going to taste this fruit, and it's almost like they're getting a foretaste, an experience of living in the land before they actually settle there. And I think this is important for reasons that I'm going to explain later, especially if we begin to um, formulate a kind of allegorical interpretation of this passage of Scripture. Moving on then to Numbers chapter 13, verses 25 to 27. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness of Paran, at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So the wilderness of Paran is south of the desert of Zin, or Sin. It is on the Sinai Peninsula, and this is where apparently the Israelites have been encamped while the spies have conducted their expedition, their reconnaissance expedition. And when the spies return after 40 days, their report of the land's wealth is very, very favorable. Well, what do they say? They say, um, um, they recount all the places that they've been, and they show the people of Israel the fruit of the land. And they say, we came to this land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. That phrase, of course, is often used to describe the promised land, land flowing with milk and honey. And this is its, its fruit. They show them a sample of what they've collected. Moving on to Numbers chapter 13, verses 28 to 29. Yet the people who live in the land are strong. And the towns are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along um, the Jordan. Okay? So although the land is very rich, the land is very fertile, there is in fact a problem. The people are strong, the towns are well fortified, and if they are going to take this land, the people of Israel are probably going to have to struggle for it. It's not going to be an easy fight. That's the implication. The spies say that they saw the descendants of Anak there. The people of Israel are kind of vaguely um, familiar with the descendants of Anak, they're aware of the fact that they are large and imposing people, and that would have created a certain degree of fear in the hearts of many of the Israelites. And aside from the um, Anakites, there are other people who live in the land who are occupying this territory. Um, several people groups are mentioned. The Amalekites, the Hittites, who live in the hill country, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, who live along the sea, okay? and also um, along the Jordan. 
So the implication here is uh, that the land, although rich, cannot be taken given the fact that the people presently occupying that land are strong and they're numerous and they're protected within these fortified cities. So the report of, of what the spies have seen in the land um, becomes very dark. But then Caleb speaks up. You'll have to remember that Caleb was one of the spies sent out. And Caleb's report is the minority report insofar as most of the spies don't agree with him. So it says, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. So Caleb expresses confidence. He says that the people are able to occupy um, the promised land now. Like if He's basically saying, if we want to go now and take this land, we can do it. Let's go. All right, so he is very confident. Later, Caleb, along with Moses and Aaron and Joshua, state their reason for their confidence. And that the reason for their confidence is the power of the Lord. Okay, it says in Numbers chapter 14, verse 10, and maybe we'll look at this next week, it says their protection is removed from them. That is the people who are currently occupying the land of Canaan. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So Caleb's confidence, his sense of, of confidence in taking the promised land, is rooted in his faith in God. Caleb again finds himself in disagreement with the rest of the spies, with the exception of Joshua, son of Nun. Uh, it doesn't really say this here in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at, but Joshua is on Caleb's side here. The other ten spies do not think that immediate seizure of the land is, is realistic. Now we move on to Numbers chapter 13, verses 32 to 33. So they brought to the Israelites an unfavorable report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land that we have gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great size. There we saw the Nephilim. The Anakites come from the Nephilim. And to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. So that they, they say that the land is large, uh, that it, they say that the land devours its inhabitants. It's hard to say what, what exactly is meant by that phrase, but perhaps they mean that the land is harsh and cruel. Maybe they mean that the land does not produce enough to support life. That if we were to go there, we would find it just exceptionally difficult to live. Which is kind of strange because earlier it seems that they said that the land was flowing with milk and honey, which implies richness, which implies fertility. They also say that they've seen the Nephilim. Um, again, these are occupants of the land that are very large, they're like giants. And it says that compared to them, the people of Israel are like mere insects. Now, the question is, are these spies telling the truth about the land? Or are they exaggerating the truth? Or are they all outright lying to the people of Israel? Maybe they are absolutely convinced that there's no way they could possibly enter into Canaan and settle there because of the, the inhabitants that already live there. So to dissuade the rest of their countrymen from ever um, going into the new land, they're giving them all of these exaggerated false reports about what they've seen. Okay, That's very probable. And again, their motive would be to dissuade the Israelites from ever wanting to move in there at all. They want essentially to defame or slander the land that, that God has promised to give them. All right. Finally, Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. So the 
unfavorable report of the ten spies has ultimately achieved its its intended results. By the way, I said say ten spies again because Caleb was positive about the po prospect of entering the land, and so was Joshua. But the rest of the 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 the, the spies give an unfavorable report, and that achieves its intended results. The people of Israel begin to despair. They start to think to themselves, it's, it's not possible. There's no way we're going to be able to settle this land. And then they go on making the same complaint that they've been making since they left the land of Egypt. They said that they would have rather died in Egypt than wander through the, the wilderness only to stand on the verge of taking the promised land and then be cut down by their enemies. It would have been better if they just died back in Egypt. Or it would have been better if they had stayed in Egypt and just been slaves. And again, this attitude has its roots in a lack of trust. They, they, they lack trust in God, um, even though God has been with them since the very beginning. It was God who freed them from slavery in Egypt, taking them through the waters of the Red Sea on dry ground, it was God who led them in a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. God who gave them water to drink from the rock. God who purified sources of unclean water. It was God who gave them bread to eat from heaven and quails to eat when they were hungry for meat. So God has consistently provided for the people of Israel. God has enabled them to triumph in battle against their enemies, as we learned in last week's Bible study. And still... Still, the people of Israel are not convinced that God will help them enter into the promised land. And they begin to moan and complain and say, it's better if we go back to Egypt than if we died here and if our, our wives were killed and our, our children slaughtered and enslaved. So they want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back to Egypt. And in fact... They are so convinced that life would be better in Egypt that they start making plans to go back. It says, let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. So let's basically fire Moses, fire Aaron, and we'll choose a new leader from amongst ourselves, and that man will take us back home. And I'm going to end it there for today uh, with this passage of Scripture. But what I want to do briefly is kind of touch on a potential allegorical interpretation of this passage of Scripture. Okay. So I want you to think about it this way. The people of Israel are like us. And by us, I mean the people of the church, followers of Jesus. All right? Um, so you could, you could make a, a parallel between Israel on the one hand in the Old Testament and the church here and now. Okay, we are the chosen people of God. And just like the people of Israel, we were set free from slavery. The people of Israel were set free from slavery to, um, to, to, to Pharaoh in Egypt. And we have been set free from the forces of sin and death through Jesus' death on the cross. Right, and, and again, to make another parallel, the people of Israel crossed the waters of uh, the, the Red Sea to enter into freedom. We, in a manner of speaking, you know, traverse the waters of baptism where we are joined to Christ. We share in his victory over sin and death and we enter into freedom. All right? And just as the people of Israel had to journey through the wilderness to get to the promised land, we, the people of Christ, we, the people of the church, journey through the wilderness of this life with our Lord together. And our promised land is not any geographical space on the earth. It's not a particular location. Our promised land is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a very um, a prominent idea in the New Testament, a very central teaching in the teachings of Jesus. And it's the idea that one day the entire cosmos will be renewed, will be restored, would be made whole again, that the power of sin and death would be utterly defeated forever and completely, and that God will reign forever over all creation as Lord of all. That's the kingdom of God. And so we're journeying towards the kingdom of God through this life. 
Okay? So we anticipate the coming of the kingdom of God. We anticipate entering into God's kingdom. Now, the good thing is, on the desert journey that we're on, occasionally we'll experience a foretaste of the kingdom of God. So you'll remember in the story that you just heard that the spies brought back grapes and figs from the promised land, and the people of Israel were able to taste and see that the Lord is good. They were able to taste the fruit of the promised land, and experience in advance um, the fruit of the promised land. I think there are ways in which we, the people of the church, have a foretaste of the kingdom of God. I think one literal foretaste of the kingdom of God is the sacrament of, of Holy Communion, when we eat the bread and drink the wine. The idea here is that we are, when we share the, the bread and the wine together, experiencing a kind of foretaste of the kingdom of God, um, even though we're not in the kingdom of God yet. And I definitely think that as we live out our lives in, in Jesus Christ together, as we practice the way of Jesus, as we love and serve one another here and now, as we take care of the sick and look after them, as we reach out to the lonely and draw them into the community and fellowship of the church, as we, um, as we serve Jesus here and now, we're given little glimpses of what life will be like in the kingdom of God. We're able to see little glimpses, little flashes of insight into um, the perfect world that we really long for. Okay, so that for us is like the, you know, the, the fruits um, that we would receive in advance. Okay, now the temptation for the people of Israel was to say, look, this journey is so hard and the prospect of entering into the promised land so daunting that we're just going to give up. We're going to abandon the journey and we're going to go back to Egypt where at the very least we knew we had food, right? Um, so they form a back to Egypt committee and basically start making plans to head home. I suppose there is a comparable um, temptation for disciples of Jesus because the journey with Jesus is a difficult one. It's not easy to walk with him. There are many challenges along the way. There's much opposition along the way. And the temptation we might face is to just abandon him entirely, to lose our faith, so to speak, to abandon our faith in him, and to, in a manner of speaking, head back to the land of Egypt, to head back to um, inhabiting, so to speak, a place of sin and death. I would say that today's passage of scripture is a warning against that. Um, we are encouraged, I think, to be like Caleb, to be like Joshua, and to, to be like Moses, and to have faith that God will not only carry us through the journey, but bring us into the promised land, bring us into the kingdom of God. And that's important to remember when things get particularly difficult and when we feel like uh, we want to throw in the towel and give up. Um, so there's, I, I suppose you could say a word of encouragement here that through Christ, in Christ, it's possible for us to take the kingdom of God, to enter into the kingdom of God, to find ourselves at home in it. Um, but, um, but we have to stay strong and fight the temptation to give up. All right. So thank you very much for joining me today in this exploration of this story from the book of Numbers. Next week, we are going to find out what the consequence of Israel's decision is. Israel chose not to enter into the promised land. They were too afraid. They, they didn't have faith in God. So what happens? Do they go back to Egypt? <laughs> we'll find out when we take a, a look at the, the second part of this reading from the book of Numbers. Thank you.